Hey everyone, welcome back to Lab Coats. Methylamine is a simple organic compound that can be used to synthesize a lot of interesting substances, including a few that unfortunately tend to give it a bit of a bad reputation. Consequently, even though it's completely legal and fairly safe, a lot of content involving it tends to get taken down. And honestly, I'm sick of it. Not just the unfair judgment of methylamine, but the blatant censorship of science creators on YouTube in general. There are safeguards that allow educational and scientific content to exist, and yet channels like Chemdelic, Nerd Rage, Apoptosis, and so many more get their harmless content removed that is obviously within YouTube's guidelines. The reason? Often enough, it's not even something the video shows, like firearm abuse, the use or sale of drugs, or simply harmful or dangerous acts. Kinda funny, since there are channels like Houston Jones, which thrive almost exclusively off self-harm. Worse yet, there have been cases where YouTube took down whole channels without warning or even reviewing their content. The original Explosions and Fire, Chem Player, and most recently, The Canadian Chemist have all met this fate. Granted, most have come back, and by a stroke of luck, The Canadian Chemist actually got his original channel back, but this should not be happening. So, in an attempt to draw attention to this issue, I'll be making the, once again, completely legal and safe, methylamine. Doing so does not violate YouTube's guidelines, and nothing illegal or psychoactive was ever shown, so in theory I should be fine. But who knows, maybe YouTube will take the bait, and I'll get to have fun playing the martyr. Anyway, methylamine has many, many applications, and similarly, there are many, many ways to make it. The most popular route that I'm aware of involves decomposing hexamine with hydrochloric acid, which is handy because both components can be bought at basically any supermarket. This pathway proceeds via the formation of formaldehyde and ammonium chloride intermediates. And interestingly enough, you can also just buy these chemicals and get the same result. I'm leaving out a lot of details about the workup, which tends to be a bit troublesome thanks to the presence of ammonia, so if you want to know more, go check out Apoptosis and his video on the subject. Another somewhat accessible pathway to methylamine was demonstrated a few years ago by Thai Labs, although he cheekily referred to his product as ammonium methyl sulfate to avoid the potential drama. Basically, he reacted sulfamic acid with methanol, and directly obtained methylamine sulfate after refluxing for a few hours. This seems to be a very clean, high-yielding pathway for anyone who's interested. Since I personally didn't need very much, and I had a vastly different selection of chemicals at the time of recording this, my approach to making methylamine wound up being pretty unique from the other videos I've seen on the subject, and it almost completely eliminated contamination from ammonia. I'm not saying this pathway is better, far from it in fact. But, if you have the right chemicals on hand already, it just might be worth your time. And speaking of, wouldn't you agree that personal privacy is worth your time? I certainly do. Unfortunately, we live in a digital era where stuff like your name, email, and even social security number can be collected, bought, and sold by people who might not have your best interests at heart. You can request your information be removed, but with all the data brokers that exist, this tends to be a lot more complicated and labor-intensive than you might think. This is where Incogni comes in. Incogni reaches out to data brokers and other people search groups that might be using your data, and requests that be removed for you, even tackling objections should they come up. Signing up is super simple. Just go to their website, authorize them to work on your behalf, and that's it. It's also easy to monitor Incogni's progress as they scrub the internet of your information, and even see who's using your data, how compliant they're being, and how severe the risk is. Best of all, as long as you're signed up with Incogni, they will continue to follow up with these data harvesting sites indefinitely. Go to incogni.com slash labcoats to get 60% off their annual plan, which comes with a risk-free 30-day money-back guarantee. By signing up, you're taking control of your online presence and reducing your risk of being targeted by spam. As usual, the links are down below. Now, to make methylamine, I only needed three components. Nitromethane, a source of hydrogen, and a catalyst. In my case, I used 5 grams of 10% palladium on carbon, but others like Arushabara or Rainy Nickel probably would have worked better. There are honestly a lot of different reducing agents that could be used here, including iron or zinc refluxed in acetic or formic acid, but palladium on carbon is what I had at the time, and it seemed like the least chemical consuming option. To make the hydrogen, I set up a flask with 6 grams of aluminum foil and 12 milliliters of hydrochloric acid. This produces enough hydrogen to fill roughly one balloon, and since I used about 3 during this process, my grand total was 18 grams of foil and 36 milliliters of acid. Also, for safety reasons, 
I flushed all the flasks with butane to eliminate the oxygen and prevent spontaneous ignition. Palladium on carbon can ignite hydrogen under the right conditions, and that was something I really preferred to avoid. As the first balloon was filling, I added 17 milliliters of nitromethane to a 250 milliliter flask, along with 30 milliliters of hydrochloric acid. By itself, methylamine is actually a gas like ammonia, but with the acid present, it gets trapped as its non-volatile hydrochloride salt, which is more than happy to stay in solution. The acid might also act as a catalyst by donating hydrogen ions, but I'm not totally sure. With the mixture stirring, roughly 5 grams of palladium on carbon was dumped in. This was actually a massive excess, and I was mostly overcompensating in hopes the reaction would work better. Remember, this stuff is catalytic, so only a tiny bit is actually needed. When I first attached the hydrogen though, the excess catalyst didn't really seem to help. The balloon barely shrank after a full day of stirring which indicated that the reaction hadn't taken place. This made me a bit worried, but then I remembered something. In almost every nitro reduction I'd seen, a solvent was used to dilute the reagents. So, like any chemist going through a rough time, I grabbed my bottle of alcohol and poured myself about 5 ounces, or 150 milliliters. This went straight into the flask, and after fixing my setup, the balloon actually seemed to shrink. It took several hours and a few rounds of hydrogen, but this time, the reaction actually seemed complete. Upon filtering off the palladium catalyst, I was left with a crystal clear solution, which I boiled down to remove the ethanol, acid, and leftover nitromethane. Things seemed to be going pretty well at first, but then reality struck. As the volume decreased, the mixture became darker, and upon boiling to dryness, tar. And I don't think all that color came from the residual palladium on carbon. Worse yet, the tar only weighed 3 grams, so I knew my methylamine recovery would be pretty laughable. I really don't know how such a devastating tragedy could occur with such basic chemistry. But here we are. Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. <sighs> don't cry. Alright, it is what it is. Let's see how much methylamine I got out. As a test, I added a bit of dilute sodium hydroxide solution to the residue. This gave a definite amine odor, and would you look at that? The lid of my hydrochloric acid container fumes when it's brought nearby. So there was at least some methylamine, and you'd better believe I was going to distill it off. I set up a crude distillation with a mixture of hydrochloric acid and methanol in both the receiving flask and a gas bubbler trap. Heating the tar caused a bunch of white fumes to fill the flask, and after a bit of careful blow torching, thanks to my crippling impatience, enough methylamine came over to actually crash out as its hydrochloride, which is poorly soluble in methanol. I knew it was only a little, but you've got to take the winds life gives you. Sadly though, some of the water began to distill over, and most of my product redissolved. Ah well, nothing a bit more boiling won't fix. Cooking the solution down left me with a saturated solution of methylamine hydrochloride, which I continued to heat in a small beaker. As the concentrated salt began to superheat, the mixture started to bump, pop, and otherwise make a mess like a spoiled child. So I placed a flask over the top and sent it to bed without dinner. This seemed to do the job, and after a bit more heating, I was left with roughly 1 gram of off-white methylamine hydrochloride. In terms of yield, that's about 5%. Pretty bad, but this has really been my trend with amines lately. Tert-butylamine was around 10%, propylhexadrine was less than 5 and dopamine? We don't really talk about dopamine. Thankfully, I might be getting a bit better. In one of my next videos, I'll be showing off a unique and completely over-the-counter method for making diethylamine which actually gave me a very impressive yield on the first try. Be sure to stick around for that. Or while you're waiting, maybe go watch my last video about making fluorine gas. It's pretty much the only video demonstrating the process, at least for now, and it's packed with tons of very cool reactions. As usual, a big thanks goes out to all of my supporters on Patreon. Chemistry isn't free, and they're the ones who truly make videos like this possible. Remember to like, share, and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Lab Coats, out.